Well, hi, George. Thank you for um, allowing me to sit down in conversation with you today. Uh, my name is Jake Fing. I am a proud Gamilaro man from Maury, New oh. South Wales. Just before we start, I'd like to give an acknowledgement um, to Elders past, present and emerging, um, not only on the land on which we're having our interview today, but also to all Aboriginal nations and Torres Strait Islander nations that are out there, um, from everyone who may be chiming in to, um, to watch. So thank you. Um, just to kick things off, can you tell us a bit more about yourself? So I'm the co-founder, director and CEO of the National Justice Project. I wake up every morning and I really love coming to work, but it can be extraordinarily traumatic too. We're dealing with families who've suffered uh, you know, pain and harm, even deaths in the family, and um, trying to manage that at a personal level and deal with their grief and trauma is a really complex task. But I really love what we do and basically what we do is fight racial discrimination and discrimination of all sorts, but mostly racial discrimination in this country in all the organs of government, you know, whether it's policing, whether it's prison, whether it's youth detention, whether it's immigration detention, or whether it's healthcare or child removals, there's racism involved and there's no lack of work for us. In your work, um, with the National Justice Project, mm. and even in your experience prior to um, founding the organisation, what did you see uh, as, I guess, a potential solution? And that, that's quite a broad question, but what, what are some ways that you see as us moving forward okay. um, to get to that point? That's a, it's a very good question. And, you know, it's, it's, Australia struggled with it since its colonial inception. You know, 230 years of colonial discrimination is something that's not easy to erase. Um, I don't ha claim to have all the answers, but I can tell you what I think might be a good start. I, I think we have to follow, uh, listen and follow Indigenous leaders in this country. If uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples were actually listened to and given a real voice in decisions that are made about them and their communities, I think you'd start to see change. If there was uh, truth told, if Australians really accepted the, the attempted genocide and the theft of another people's land, then we might start having a, a more equal and honest relationship. And finally, treaty. I mean, you can't, we can't really have um, equality until Australians have sat down, accepted what's happened and said, this is the way we're going to move forward together. But with an empowered uh, Indigenous community, not just, you know, systems that, you know, where, you, where people are told what to do and it's not a real engagement. I think that's a good start. In terms of the criminal justice system, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody is roll gold in terms of solutions. There are 339 recommendations in that report, and they're all still relevant today, just as they were 30 years ago. And anyone that tells you that the governments have implemented them are lying, because the, you know that governments have not. You start with addressing the socioeconomic factors that led to poverty, that hasn't been addressed. You start to listen, there's a section in there about healthcare, that I can tell you that hasn't been addressed and we'll probably talk more about that later. Healthcare issues of Aboriginal people have not been addressed. There's still an enormous gap in life expectancy and the standard of care that Aboriginal people receive is not equal to others. Um, it, the suggestion, or not the suggestion, the recommendations about uh, meaningful engagement and listening to Aboriginal people, it's the same cry for a voice is in the Royal Commission report, diverting young people in particular away from the criminal justice system and into health services or social services instead of criminalising them. You know, stop criminalising alcoholism or drug addiction. You know, when we start following those recommendations, I think we'll have a fairer system. But there's more. <laughs> One of the things I've been pushing for more recently is to appoint Indigenous investigators, so 
indigenous coroners to investigate deaths in custody because they have lived experience. They will look at that death from a totally different perspective. Also, perhaps, you know, expanding the Koori Court or the or Aboriginal Court so that there's more culturally appropriate decision making, not white man's law being imposed in a colonial way. That That's sort of the criminal justice system. Yeah. Uh, if we look at the police, I think everything starts at the top, it starts with their name. Why are they police force? They should be a police service. They're here to serve us. Their objectives need to change. What's their main objectives? Their main objectives are protection of property and, and the protection of the community. And when we talk about the community, that often does not include marginalised peoples. So they're the others. And the whole system is culturally unsafe, disrespectful, and actually fails to implement the recommendations of the Royal Commission, which is to divert people away from the criminal justice system. Police get promoted on the number of arrests they make or charges that stick. It's not a question of um, how many kids did you divert away from justice system this, this week. When they start measuring welfare outcomes rather than you know charging people and grinding them through the system, you might get better results. Now, you, you mentioned previously about the, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Yep. Um, you've had a lot of experience over the years working in that very traumatic, very sad yes. field. Uh, I guess just, just in terms of our, our conversation, do any, any particular cases or any um, families that you've worked with um, come to mind? I mean, obviously there, there are so many cases out there. Yeah. Um, but I guess just a, a snapshot for, for people who are watching of, of the, some of the types of work that you've done right. over the years. Um, we're kind of fortunate um, in that we can provide a really deep level of engagement with our clients. So we're not just there for the courtroom, but we're there for them and we stand with them for the long term. And, you know, I feel almost in part of, you know, the families that we've taken on the journey for, for, of um, healing for them, hopefully, and change. That's what they're all after. And we, we have an alignment with the families. We understand that they need closure often with a death and they want the truth to be told. But all the families we work with, they want to see that this never happens again to any other family. So our values and our objectives are aligned. Um, there's two in particular that I think stand out. Um, Naomi Williams, uh, a young 27-year-old Wiradjuri um, woman uh, who presented to Tumut Hospital 15 times in the months before she died. She was six months pregnant at the time she died. Each time she attended that hospital, she was stereotyped as a drug user. And uh, her mother had written to the hospital and begged them not to stereotype her daughter and to provide her with a referral to a specialist, which is what she needed because she, she was quite sick. And um, I'm not saying anything that's not in the in yeah. the in the um, in the public, Coronial, domain, in the public yeah. domain, uh, or that her mother wouldn't want said. Um, on the last occasion, she presented New Year's Eve or New Year's Day 2016. She was sent home with two Panadols and she passed away from septicemia. She was extremely sick. All the signals, the, all the red flags were there and they were missed. And we argued, I think successfully before the coroner, that racial prejudice had played a role in her death. And the coroner made some profound findings for change in the health system in New South Wales and nationally um, as a result of Naomi's death. Now you can't bring Naomi back, but um, if we can ensure that her death wasn't in vain by protecting other people from this system, um, that's a positive outcome. Um, and I truly feel part of that wonderful family from Brungle 
and I've learned so much about um, the, her the, the Aboriginal heritage of the area and the discrimination that they faced. I, I really do, um, I don't know, you know, it's, it's more than just a job for me yeah. to get justice for that family. And the same, I think, can be said for David Dungay's family. David Dungay Jr. was uh, in Long Bay Jail uh, not long before, uh, actually he died a few days before uh, Naomi. Um, he was a diabetic and he was in the mental health ward of the prison hospital on the day that he died. He had high blood sugar. And one of the, essentially what happened was one of the guards, um, either by mistake or for some other reason, took it upon himself to say that David couldn't eat a packet of biscuits. That wasn't, you know, that decision was made by a guard, not a doctor, a guard. And that decision ultimately led to David's death because David refused to give the guard the biscuits. And the evidence at the inquest was he would not have died eating those biscuits. But a decision was made to move him. And uh, they called the IAT team, which is a, you know, a team that's trained to subdue prisoners. They called on David to give up his biscuits. He didn't, it was the one little pleasure he had and um, he'd done nothing wrong, but they decided as a, as a, because he didn't obey their instructions that they were come and, gonna come and subdue him. And then what, what essentially happened was mission creep. What started with a packet of bis biscuits ended up as a move to another cell and then became, oh, we better hold him down to provide um, the nurses with an opportunity to um, provide a chemical sedative. And then it kept going on and on for about nine minutes until David died in very similar circumstances to George Floyd. Um, officers had a knee in, David, uh, in David's back, near his neck, he couldn't breathe. He said he couldn't breathe about 10 times. Mm. The officers said, well, if you can talk, you can breathe. And that's what they said to George Floyd as well. And David unfortunately passed. And, uh, you know, I won't go into to further details about the, the, the stuff ups in the hospital, but it was, it was just a mess. And ultimately, David's family feel that whilst they've learned a lot about the circumstances of his death, no one has ever been held accountable and there's been no change. They want systemic change and they've been fighting for five years for change. And we've been fighting all the way with them. Even tomorrow, there's going to be a protest. They want Safe Work New South Wales to investigate this death. Safe Work New South Wales will investigate this office if someone loses their finger in the office, but they won't lift a finger to investigate an Aboriginal death in custody. Um, they, the, their equivalent in Western Australia, uh, WorkSafe prosecuted Serco when Mr. Ward passed away in the back of a, of a prison van, but they will not investigate David's death. They want the DPP to investigate David's death. They feel that, they, that there is um, potential for charges to be laid. They're not getting anywhere there either. And we're gonna keep standing with them until that happens. That leads me into a more broader conversation um, based on that systemic change. What, in your vision as mm. a legal practitioner, social justice activist, what do you see as a non non abusive, non racist, non discriminatory criminal justice system? Mm. You know, and that that's a very broad concept. Um, but I guess in, in, once again, drawing on your experience, what do you see as the picture-perfect Australia or even the picture-perfect New South Wales? <laughs> that will take a culture shift right from the top and right from our parliament. And unfortunately, I just don't see it in the current environment, not in this Trumpian world where conservatives seem to rule and, and, and there seems to be a, a war amongst political parties for get tough on crime. Get tough on crime means pick on the most vulnerable, pick on the low lying fruit. They don't pick on the kids whose dads are doctors and surgeons and lawyers. They pick on the ones that they reckon they can get away with it. 
So that's that's the start. The criminal justice system itself too needs to change. So if we stop the police from pushing people through the sausage machine, let's start developing more sympathetic courts like the drug court, the Koori court, um, you know, Aboriginal led courts have um, coroners who are Indigenous investigating Aboriginal deaths. You'll get a totally um, different set of findings and recommendations. I think that would really change this. So you've discussed that high level change that needs to change, yep. that needs to occur. Yeah. I guess for, for people who aren't in a position whereby, you know, they're a legal practitioner, they're a doctor, yep. things like that, or those higher positions yes. uh, within the society, how can, how can they get involved? That's a really good question because I don't think change is going to come about from doctors and lawyers, right? I mean, they can keep pushing, but the real change comes from the general population. How do you win their hearts and minds? And I'm not sure. I mean, it's about education. I think it starts um, with the education system. When I was at school, I learned nothing about our Aboriginal culture. I learned more about the gold rush and, you know, people coming from America and Asia to Australia for the gold rush than I did about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And that's, and that's a shocking shame. Um, you know, it's only something that I've come to learn about later. And in my life. Um, and I think that the education system is where people start to understand and understand what we've done. I think it also is partly, um, you know, the apology was a good start, but if our politicians start to acknowledge the truth about our history, then the general population will also accept it. It's easy to live in denial yeah. that, you know, and, and not recognize that our prosperity comes from the theft of another people's land and the near destruction of their culture and that there was genocide. Australians don't acknowledge that there's genocide in our country. You know, they'd be horrified. But when they learn their own history and understand that, I think we can start to have a proper engagement and go, well, maybe there is systemic problem and it starts from the original. And it's a hard thing to admit. And I, and I see it with um, refugees. When we put refugees on Nauru and uh, Manus Island in PNG, it's not our problem anymore. It goes out of our, uh, out of our minds. It's a, it's a hard thing for people to realise that there's something really evil going on in our society. It takes a, a certain, you know, generosity of spirit and intellect to, to overcome your prejudices and say, hang on, what, what's really going on here? And, and if, without a proper education, I don't think it's ever going to change. Yeah. I do have hope for the future, even in my lifetime. You know, I, I've been a lawyer for 30 years now. Um, I've seen real change. And what, what's giving me real hope is the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander professionals I'm seeing in law and in medicine and nursing and coming up even in parliament. People are starting to listen to Aboriginal people. It's taking time, and, but it will happen. And I think our children um, are, are going to grow up with better educations. And I think they'll have more understanding. I know that the, the standard of teaching for nurses and doctors is going to change to provide more culturally safe care. I haven't seen it yet with policing. But one day, maybe even they will change. Well, thank you so much for having the conversation. Um, and I, I echo your sentiments. And, you know, I really do hope that we can see that level of change in our lifetime. So thank you so much, George. My pleasure.